Are you guys are going to be scattered. You guys are even going to deny me. Uh, but, you know, uh, he says, hey, take heart because, again, you will go through this trying times. You will go through the tribulation. But I, I have overcome the world. So praise the Lord for that. Why don't we pray? Father God, we do want to thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you that uh, you give us this opportunity to come to worship you, Lord. And what a joyous time. It always is a joyous time of worship, Lord. It always is a joyous time as we unite our hearts and our minds together with you, Lord. It's always a wonderful time, Lord, as we come and seek you first in your kingdom and your righteousness, Lord. And we, we, we just uh, come and uh, we, we come and gather at your feet, Lord, as either eager children, Lord, seeking for the great things, uh, the great gifts from our Heavenly Father, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that we have the greatest gift of all, which is that life and that uh, mercy and grace of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sin, Lord, and the new life and the new hope that you bring. Father, throughout the world, people are going through various uh, trials and circumstances. We think of the people in Tonga, Lord, and the re re uh, related islands, Samoa, Lord, and some of the other atolls, Lord, in the uh, South Pacific, Father God, that uh, may have been uh, more uh, uh, affected, Lord, and inundated by the high surge, Lord, and the tsunami wave, Lord. So we pray your blessing and your protection and your provision, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that we haven't heard of any real uh, a tremendous loss of life or anything like that, like we did with the Japan earthquake, Lord, a few years back, and the uh, earthquake in Thailand a few years back, Lord. And uh, uh, we just pray, Lord, you give the wake-up calls, Lord. And we pray, Father God, that many hearts and minds and eyes might be open up to the saving grace and the love of Jesus Christ, Father. We thank you. We praise you for your faithfulness and love. We thank you again for the great joy it is we have to come and gather and worship you, Lord, to carry our Bibles, to sing our songs of praise and worship, Lord. And uh, again, we just give you all the honor, glory, and praise, so rightfully yours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Uh, guys, we, we, uh, we continue in First John, uh, uh, in our study through First John. It's important for us to remember the circumstances of this letter. Again, we go back and review, and we we're reminded uh, uh, the the scenario of the writing of First John. But remember, important in our historical roadmap, Jerusalem had already fallen to the Romans a few years uh, earlier, in 70 A.D. Many of the Jews, as well as Christians, were killed or dispersed throughout the Roman world. It was a terrible time, guys, where Rome came in and laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. And after uh, many months, I believe it was, uh, it was about six months, they did get through. They did come in. They did reap a lot of uh, destruction of life, loss of life. They did tear down the, uh, the temple brick by brick. And they were really after all the gold that was in the temple, all the gold overlay. and. Uh, Again, if you got in, uh, in the way, you know, they, they, they would take your life. John, at the time of this writing, was quite aged, guys. Uh, the time of this writing of 1 John was probably around 85 or 90, maybe up to 100 AD. So, you know, it, it was, you know, some 20, 25 or 30 years after the fall of uh, uh, Jerusalem already. It, it was uh, maybe closer to 75 years uh, uh, with the inception of the New Testament church. And, you know... Uh, the same amount of time since the uh, the death, uh, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So a lot of things that transpired. A lot of the early enthusiasm of the church, the glory and the majesty of, Je uh, of Jesus Christ, had changed from heartfelt enthusiasm and zeal, and now had degenerated to a thing of habit and a tradition from the old folks. You know, hey, uh, you know, our grandfather used to do this, our, gra our parents used to do that, they used to take us to church. And you know, a lot of the more younger guys, maybe the modern generation, they had grown away from the, uh, the enthusiasm and the zeal of their first love relationship with the Lord. Uh, many of you may describe, uh, may describe it uh, as half-hearted, you know. And uh, again, it was a thing of habit, a thing of rope, a thing of tradition. The wonder and awe of the love of Jesus Christ, the moving, the dynamic power of the Spirit had become old and 
as hearts grew, grew cold. You know, as we grow, we, we, we grow away, go away from the Lord, you know, the, 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 the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit seems to grow a little bit cold too. As we, you know, as we think of that old adage, you take a lump of charcoal out of the, uh, the fire and you lay it off to the side, it's, it quickly uh, grows cold and, and, and peels out. But you know, when you have that whole bunch of coals together, they burn bright and strong and fervent. And you know, the, uh, the, the Sunday morning, Saturday, whatever the time you worship, Sunday night, Wednesday, uh, throughout the midweek, the studies and so on and so forth, it becomes a time where the, uh, the, there's this universal celebration and a greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a greater ministry, a greater moving uh, of the dy dynamic power of the Spirit as we gather together the people of God, the body of Christ, His church, guys. So at times people may have grown uh, weary finding Christianity a burden. Oh, it's a burden to get up. It's a burden to uh, come to church. It's a, you know, I, I, I don't want to do it because, oh, I'm tired. I have a good excuse. And probably that's the greatest time to come out. Um, you know, not a, not a burden, but, you know, it, it should be a great joy. And uh, God doesn't want us to serve out of the things of a, it, we, it's a hardship and begrudgingly come. It's like the, the guys that give begrudgingly. Uh, you know, the Lord would say, hey, take your money back or take your service back because, you know, I, I love a cheerful giver. I love that one that comes. And, you know, I think it was prayed earlier that we, we offer up a li our lives as a sacrifice of praise. We offer up our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God, our reasonable wor uh, 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 worship, a uh, uh, service of worship towards Him. You know, and, and, and that says uh, we, we come giving ourselves first. Everything else just kind of follows along. But, you know, to be called a saint, and, you know, people were called saints back then, uh, it just simply meant to be set apart. It, was, uh, uh, it, it called Christians to be set apart from the world. And as time went on, maybe the youth and the lukewarmness within the hearts of people uh, found the world more attractive. Ooh, the, oh, my, my friend's going party. Oh, my friend's going to do this and that. Or, oh, you know, I just go miss. Oh, I'm going golfing. You know, <laughs> what, what, oh, the guy's like, go ride motorcycle. Whatever it might be, uh, the things of the world uh, were more attractive. And things of moral purity, love in Christ, and really the love of Christ over the things of the world grew more wearisome. You know, it, become a, it became, we, we became weary of doing this. And, you know, it wasn't out of the, the, the motivation of the love of God or the, the leading of the Spirit, but it became a thing of the work, and in, uh, the work of the flesh. And as we do things in the flesh, it be, we, we grow weary. It, it, it gets tiring. New life, new love, new hope, new forgiveness became more difficult without the love and the power of the Lord. You know? So uh, this is where the, the heart of the people were at. The real danger was the hearts going cold and the attractiveness of heretical teachers that were coming out during this period of time, leading people astray. They said that, hey, because you live in this body, you can't help yourself, so just give yourself over to the, the, the lusts and the desires of your flesh because you live in this uh, body. The spirit is good, but you know, give yourself over to the pleasures of the world, the pleasures of the flesh. And you know, it was a strange teaching that you know, Jesus had tried to call us uh, out of that and to be separate from the things of the world. Yet uh, these teachings became even more attractive that says, oh, you can fan the flames of your lust and fa fan the flames of your desires. And not only that, not only fan the flames, but fulfill the desires that you have. Uh, so many years back, there was a, uh, there was a movement with the, within the church uh, called the Emergent Church, the Emergent Church. And you know, a lot of guys were talking about this Emergent Church, and a lot of, a lot of the Calvary guys were kind of concerned because even from within the confines of the Calvary chapels, a lot of these guys were embracing things of the Emergent Church. And what this Emergent Church was, uh, was going back, they were using terms like contemplative, prayer or contemplative uh, uh, the things of the Lord and uh, things like candles, things like stained glass or things like uh, the more ritualistic things of liturgy and so on and so forth that, you know, most of us have had left. You know, we're coming back, we're creeping back in and uh, uh, these things of uh, uh, strange or new forms of worship or really old forms uh, that had uh, 
rebranded themselves and renamed themselves and repackaged themselves as saying that, hey, we're going to go by, uh, uh, we're going to have this statue, we're going to have the stained glass, we're going to have the candles, and uh, uh, we're going to have this contemplative prayer and contemplate who God really is and, you know, our relationship to him. But, you know, it, it kind of came and went. Uh, uh, it was a worrisome thing, but to think that, uh, you know, we would slide back or slip back into the things of that. And, you know, guys have told me, oh, it's so, um, uh, it's so spiritually uplifting to sit uh, uh, in that scenario and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, guys with certain uh, backgrounds, uh, parts of uh, uh, the Christian church, but again, growing up in some of those uh, uh, more uh, uh, stayed type of backgrounds. But guys, uh, uh, things of moral purity, the love in Christ, really the love of Christ over the things of the world grew more and more wearisome, that new life, that new love, that new hope. All these things uh, uh, were difficult. And again, the heretical teachers were leading people astray. That's exactly what was happening. Persecution would come uh, in the form of the Roman uh, the Roman uh, emperor. But uh, again, it was really a, a subtle way of the people's hearts were being drawn away. People were coming to that place of hey, the, the, the simplicity and the purity of devotion of Jesus Christ and following after th these uh, things. But we'll pick up our study today in chapter three, verse nine, chapter three, verse nine. But, you know, as I mentioned last week, it was a little bit of a difficult uh, passage. And I never thought that John was such a, a deep guy because you know early on uh, they used to uh, tell new believers we used to tell new believers hey read the gospel of John or better yet read first John and we thought that it had all the answers and we we uh, it does have all the answers the word of God really has all the answers but sometimes when you look at it uh, it really begins to speak of speak to you very uh, straight without pulling any punches without sugarcoating things but as we look at uh, the previous, uh, as we review the, the previous verses, verses 3 to 8, one scholar put it as the test of progress is obedience. The test of progress is obedience. Progress does not confer the privilege to sin. The further on a man is, the more disciplined a character he will be. And I thought, wow, that's so heavy. The further along in our walk and in our relationship with the Lord, the more obedient we come. Uh, uh, because we're growing in the Lord, our progress does not mean we give in or we uh, kowtow to the privilege of sin. But the further on a man is, the more disciplined a character he will be. And the, the guy's name is A.E. Brook. And I thought that that was such a wonderful thought that the further a man is uh, uh, along in his relationship with the Lord, he becomes a more disciplined character. And uh, I like to think that hey, all of us today might say that hey, we, we, we've grown in the Lord, we've walked with the Lord, and uh, we've become uh, quite a far away from where we were before. And uh, we've become a little bit more disciplined in the things of the, the world, the flesh and the devil. And uh, again, we've become really not a character uh, in the world or of the world, but we've become a character of Jesus Christ, guys. In the previous verses, John tries to impart certain basic truths about sin. And number one, first he tells us what sin is, you know, in the, in the previous verses. It's a deliberate breaking of a law when man, uh, which man knows. Sin is to obey self rather than God. And, you know, this is where the people were at. They said that, hey, I can, instead of going to temple, I, uh, instead of going to the synagogue or my meeting, my, my meeting of believers, hey, I'm going, I'm going to go to the temple. I'm going to worship uh, via the temple prostitutes. I'm going to go party. I'm going to go have a party down there. And, uh, you know, what, uh, what goes on in Corinth stays in Corinth. And, you know, I think that a lot of the guys, their attitudes were that, hey, you know, you're taking a break from the things of the Lord and you're going back to, to entertain the things of the flesh. Number two, he tells us what sin does. Sin undoes the work of God. You know, if we give in to sin, all the good work that God has begun in us, that sin undoes the work of God. Uh, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, um, uh, and, and to sin is to bring back that 
which he came to do away with. You know, Jesus came to do away with sin. He came to wash us and cleanse us, to lead us and to guide us, to be with us, to shepherd us through the difficult times of the trial and the tribulation. And the, the big word is the T word, it's the temptation, you know, that you, you know, we love to give into. And he tells us, uh, sin undoes the work of God. What God wants to do a good work, God has begun a good work. Sin undoes the work of God. And, uh, uh, you know, as, as Paul wrote it, he says, uh, uh, he who began a good work will complete it, you know, until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, God, Jesus is always working in us. But if we go and we willfully or deliberately live or abide in this sin, uh, it, uh, 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 it, it becomes something that uh, uh, undoes all the good work that he does. John tells us what sin is. Sin comes from failure to abide in Christ. And here's that word again. Remember John, he loves this word abide. He, he used that first of all in the Gospel of John, but when he says, hey, abide in the vine, you know, and uh, in other words, abide in the, the, the growing and the working and the vine of Jesus Christ. But as we live in a continual, in the continual presence of God, we will not sin. So, you know, the, the thing is, uh, uh, the more we can continue on in God's presence, hey, the greater our power is the more we will not sin. It is when we go outside of his presence, we sin, we say, hey, Jesus, I'm leaving you at the door. Leave me alone or stay in here because I'm going out. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to have a little fun. I'm going to have a little fling, you know, whatever it might be. And uh, he says that uh, when we go outside of his presence, we sin. And number four, John identifies where sin comes from. It comes from the devil. And the, it, uh, in this world, there is a power hostile towards God. You guys know that. You guys believe that. And, you know, the world forces of darkness, you know, the, the prince of the power of the air, the, the sons of disobedience, now who are, are at work in this world. Uh, I just kind of love that, uh, the sons of disobedience uh, I've spoken of in uh, Ephesians. Because, you know, you said, oh, I know some of those guys. <laughs> those sons of disobedience. And, you know, I can laugh about it, but, but truly eh, there's a lot of these sons of disobedience who are now at work in this world. It began during the time of Paul writing that letter while he sat in the, uh, the prison in Rome, and it continues on to this day. The sons of disobedience now at work within this world. Number five, John tells us how sin is conquered. Revelation 20.10 tells us, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet also are. You know, we know that, uh, and we know that the devil knows that uh, his days are numbered. We know that he knows that until uh, he is uh, thrown into that lake of fire, he's going to wreak havoc within the world. He's going to lead people astray. He's going to lead people or, or hold captive within prisons and uh and sometimes, you know, uh, I, there was a movie, I think uh, it was God's Not Dead, and uh, the, the lady was telling her son that hey, sometimes people are imprisoned by the world, the flesh, and the devil. The door is wide open, and that door, the door to life is Jesus Christ, and yet they fail to walk out of that door. They fail to take that step of faith. They fail to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior, and in that they keep themselves locked up in that prison, imprisoned by the things, again, of the world, the flesh, and the devil. But in verse 9, he says that no one is born of God, chapter 3, verse 9, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Guys, John writes here in, uh, in verse 9 about those born of God, those born of God. Peter speaks of the very same thing in his first letter, saying, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living, abiding word of God. You know, and I, I, I love that thought that, hey, we are born again. We are these born-again Christians, and we are those who have been born from seed, uh, from seed which is imperishable uh, through the living, abiding 
word of God. And you know, uh, uh, Peter was so heavy, he, you know, he uses that term and he tells us exactly what it is. We truly have been born again to a living hope. We truly have been born again uh, through the living, abiding, and word of God. James shares the same thought in James chapter 1, verse 18, saying that in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we might be, as, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. You know, it was God's good and perfect will that we would be brought forth by the word of his truth, guys. And you know, uh, uh, the book of Galatians is one of Paul's earlier writings, but he keeps mentioning the truth of the word of God, the truth of the word of God, the truth of the word of God. And the same, these same New Testament writers speak of the same thing, the truth of the word of God. If we stay within the truth of the word of God, if we truly have been born again to this living hope, if we have been brought forth by the word of truth or the truth of God, uh, 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 as it were, the first fruits among his many creatures, and we become as those who can uh, handle, who can walk, who can stay the course. Because you know why? We, we staying it according uh, in abiding with him and in the word of truth, the word of God. Uh, I think that um, uh, why, why Calvary Chapels, we known as, uh, hey, you guys are guys of the word. Oh, yeah. Oh, Calvary Chapel, yeah, you guys are the, the guys of the word. And that we well know for that. But why is that? Because it's right here. We abide in the word. We've been saved by the word. We walk in the word. We can stay firm in the word of God the strength and the guidance of the Word of God. Ba but basically, the three writers all agree upon the, fr uh, the fact that we are born of God and we have strength and guidance uh, of the Word of God within ourselves, guys, within uh, the living Word of God uh, dwells within us. And you know, as, even as Jesus returns in the book of Revelation, what was written on his, um, his robe, his thigh? The Word of God. You know, he is the Word of God. And you know, he's the one that comes and he abides within us and dwells within us. And as we abide with him, as we stay with him, the living word of God is that one that directs us. Remember John said earlier in the book, he said that hey, you have all you need to know about the truth of the word of God because you know, the word of God dwells within you. You know, it, it, it wasn't like that we needed all these uh, supernatural teachers or all this extracurricular teaching or these guys that say, hey, I got a new uh, twist on the Word of God. I got a new uh, scope. I have a new revelation on the Word of God. Hey, the Word of God, uh, spoken as it was, written uh, as it was, uh, the Word of God stands forever. You know, the, Isaiah said it right. He said, the grass withers, the flower fades, but a wor the Word of our Lord stands forever. You know, it's forever it stands in the heavens. You know, the, the, the only thing is we got to be sure that we don't add or we don't take from it because, you know, the, uh, John in Revelation, he says, hey, whoever adds or takes from the word, all the curses of the world will fall upon him. So if you say that, hey, I, the word of God is good, but you got to buy my book. The word of God is good, but you got to go by the book of our, our, uh, our, uh, our religion or whatever it is. Or you got to buy the Bible that our scholars have tweaked and you know our Greek, Greek scholars have tweaked and so on and so forth. Not so, but for those guys, they you know they're going to fall into the the hands of the living God. You know for what they the, they they've done and what they'll be accountable for. But even worse yet, how many people have they led astray? You know when you think about it, how many have been led astray by these things? Uh, the Christian is preserved from sin by the indwelling power of the Word of God. Does it mean we're perfect? This is the hard part. This, this is the hard part. This is the part I struggled with and, you know, wrestled with. Uh, and Paul wrestled with the same thing. You know, Paul in uh, Romans chapter 7, he said that, hey, the very thing I don't want to do, Romans uh, chapter 7, he says that I wrestle <coughs> with myself. I wrestle with the things of my flesh. And, you know, wretched man that I am. He came down on himself and he said that, hey, I'm such a, a sinner, but I'm saved by the grace of God. I'm saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. John may have broken it down for us. You know, number one, saying that one day we shall be like him in uh, chapter three, verse two, and sin will be gone forever. In other words, hey, we're gonna be with him in all, for all eternity in heaven. 
And we're not, not going to have to worry about sin because you know why? We're going to be have done away from these bodies of sin and death. And it's like the spiritual man was likened as, hey, uh, I got this dead man I'm carrying around on my back and he's my burden. He's the one that makes me stink. He's the one that makes me stumble because he's a heavy weight. But you know, when we take off that old man and we put on the, the imperishable, we, we put on the new man uh, totally, uh, uh, we shall be like him and sin will be gone forever. Number two is that Christians should strive with the help of the Holy Spirit to avoid acts of sin. Remember that word strive, is, it really means, uh, the Greek word for the word strive, we have our English word agonize. We agonize that uh, I, I might not sin. We should strive. You know, it's, it's like uh, you're running a race and you, you're reaching out for that tape. You're running shoulder to shoulder with your competitor and you're trying to reach the tape. You're trying to break the barrier before he passes you. And we're striving, we're stretching, we're trying to reach out that we might do the things. Uh, 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 of course, it's with the help of the Holy Spirit to avoid the acts of sin. You know, but the, 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 this part of it is on ourselves. I cannot, I cannot help myself. Oh, the devil made me do it. Well, I gave into the, the uh, temptation. But you know, it says that Christians should strive. We should strive with the help of the Holy Spirit to avoid these acts of sin. And again, we agonize over the things and over the wickedness and the destruction of sin. Yeah, we can see it. You know, we can see the results. We can walk out here this morning. We can walk into the parking lot or look across the driveway there, and we see the results of sin. They're up and down the the sidewalk, and they're you know. They're up and down this sidewalk and that sidewalk, and uh, uh, we see the results of those who have, uh, who have uh, given over to the things of the, the sin in the world. Uh, number three is that we realize that uh, we have missteps and trespasses. We gotta realize that. And when we do sin, we must uh, contritely and humbly confess them to God. You know, sometimes we sin, we, we do it so cavalierly. <laughs> we don't even know we're sinning. We're just being uh, presumptuous. We just assume, oh God, you're gonna bless this. Uh, I'm going to work and I'm gonna try and do this. I'm gonna try and do that. And you know, the Lord took me right back to James this morning. And he says that, hey, we, we should say that we're not going to this town uh, uh, down the road, Lord, and we're going to do business and we're going to make money, we're going to do this and that. But James said, reminded us that, hey, if we um, do it, uh, we should ask the Lord, whatever it is, Lord, if it, it's your will, we shall do this or that. Um, James, James is an interesting guy and in his writing, actually, he uses some uh, neat Greek words, but, um, you know, the thing is, uh, uh, presumption is a bad thing. Presumption is a bad word. And we presume on the Lord. We presume that he's going to bless rather than saying, hey, Lord, uh, is this okay? Is that okay? Lord, can we do this? In everything, uh, take all things to the Lord. In everything, we should be with prayer and petition, supplication, with thanksgiving, uh, making our needs known and not just assuming that, oh, God, you know, I, 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 I serve you, I follow after you, I read my Bible, I share my faith, and blah, blah, blah. And you're going um, to bless me for that automatically. So I don't have to really pray about it. And I always tell you, uh, if it's a no-brainer, you better pray extra hard. Because we of, often tells our, tell ourselves, oh, it's a no-brainer. We're going to do this, we're going to do that. We're going to help this, we help with that, help with that. And, uh, oh, yeah we, yeah, we can pray about it. But we already made our mind up. I had, I, there was one guy, he, uh, he says that, oh, can you pray for me because I, I, I might, take, a, I might uh, take another job somewhere else, blah, blah, blah. But after the fact was that hey, he had already quit his job, he already found a new job, and he was already halfway moving across the world to get to that new job without, you know, the prayer was after the fact. Everything was done. Everything was set in motion. And uh, it, it kind of like, Prayer came almost secondary or third hand because hey, everything was falling into place. I presume this is your will. And uh, 
uh, you know, I, I, I guess things turned out, you know, I hope things turned out, and I'm pretty sure they turned out, but sometimes when we presume, it's a, it's a real bad thing, and you know, even for the best of Christians, we, we presume something and, you know, rather than, hey, we should be praying about this. We should really take everything to the Lord. And it's quite literal, that rubber bands that guys used to wear years ago, the WWJD, it really should be that. And, you know, some guys, uh, they, they used to tell you, oh, let me pray about it. That means, hey, go away, don't bother me. And some guys say, oh, I'm going to pray about it. That means, okay, uh, uh, come talk to me, you know, in a, a little later. And some really say that, hey, let me uh, consider it, let me pray about it, because they really need to pray about it. And uh, because they really, uh, uh, you know, they're not really sure hey, what God's perfect will is. So, um, you know, I hope that we're all in that last category where we really are considering what God wants and, and uh, taking it to Him in prayer. And a lot of times the, the answer, he'll bring the answer. He might bring the answer right away uh, uh, because people are impatient. You know, if you're dealing with other people, they might say, oh, well, you got to be here at a certain time on that certain day. You know, I know you said, let me consider it, let me pray about it, but you got to do this, you know. Uh, I, I said, oh, there's the answer to prayer. I got to do this. I got to be there. I got to do that. Uh, I don't I don't think so you know and there there became the answer to prayer because uh, uh, they couldn't take let me consider it let me pray about it for a, a reasonable answer so you know that that's uh, that's where it is that's where that presumption comes into play as we do sin guys we go contritely and humbly we confess them to the Lord and we realize his grace and forgiveness uh, but not treading on his mercy, not taking his mercy and grace cheaply. Like, yeah, I can sin all I like, Lord, and all I'm going to do is come and, oh, 1 John 1, 9, I'm going to confess my sin, and he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins. Not so. But we, we try to, uh, not treading on his mercy, but really turning or repenting. You, don't, uh, you know, I, I, I don't need, use that word enough, repentance. You know, that we got to turn, we got to repent from the way we're going and turn to the way of the Lord. Number four, in all of this, it's hard to think or imagine that a Christian can be a deliberate, deliberate and regular sinner with sin dominating his life. Isn't that difficult to think that, hey, uh, we have Christian brothers and sisters, that a Christian can be a deliberate and regular sinner with sin dominating his life. Oh, that's so difficult. It hurts coming out of my mouth, but it's the truth of the truth. See? So uh, don't get me wrong. John is not setting before us a life of demanding per, uh, perfection. He's not saying, hey, you got to be perfect or you're not saved. You got to be perfect or you're going to face the consequences. But if he does desire, at the, the, as the Lord does, that the child of God is watchful against sin. There's the, the word watchful against sin. A life in which sin is not the norm, but the abnormal uh, moment of defeat. You know, sin can be that abnormal moment of defeat. You, you, uh, you get angry, you explode, you, you flare up, and whatever it might be, you say something. And some guys, they spout out. And, you know, some, sometimes you've got friends you know that when they're hurting, they, they, they got trouble, or whatever's going on in their life, they just kind of blab it all out, you know. And they, they give you the worst case scenario, but really they, I think they're trying to say, hey, can you pray for me because I'm going through a hard time. I'm going through a hard time. For others, it might just be reading something. Uh, it might be a little devotion like our shepherd to the sheep or whatever that speaks volumes to their hearts. You know, it's, it might be something so small, so minor, uh, but uh, it, it might be something that uh, uh, says that hey, this, this is an abnormal moment of defeat. I'm really not like that. I really want to trust God, but I'm having a hard time. You know, I'm really having a hard time because all these things, like these ripples coming across the ocean, they're all whacking me one after the other, and I'm feeling the effects of it. I'm feeling the weight. I'm feeling the burden. And uh, 
Uh, sin is not the norm for most Christians, guys, but abnormal, uh, the abnormal in a moment of defeat. John is not saying the man or woman of God cannot sin, but he is saying that the one who abides in sin, here's that word again, abide. Do we stay in that sin? Do we remain in that sin? Or do we try and get the R word into motion in our lives, the word of repentance? Uh, 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 the one who abides uh, in him, the one who abides in God, cannot continue to be a deliberate sinner. Wow, that's heavy. Uh, hey, are we going to uh, be that de deliberately living our life in sin, or uh, do we turn from it? Do we turn the, ch the, the, uh, the thing, the tube, the channel? Do we turn our eyes? Do we turn away from the things uh, that pop up on the computer screen, whatever it might be? Do we turn away from that moment of wrath or that moment of temptation or the, 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 the bottle that's stuck in your face? Uh, uh, for many years, I knew what that was about. You know, people would always be trying to stick a bottle of beer in my face, in my hand. And uh, after a few years, they kind of gave up. And, uh, uh, but but it, it became a time that just says, hey, I'm not going there. I had enough, man. You know, I have the liberty. I can drink all the beer I like. I just don't want to. You know, I just don't like. <laughs> I can drink all I like, but I just don't want it, you know. And uh, John is saying again, uh, sin cannot, uh, uh, God's people, you know, the one who is abiding in God cannot continue to be that deliberate sinner. So it, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's tough. You know, we, we're not going to deliberately go out. We're not going to deliberately rob or rape or murder or whatever it may be <coughs> god's uh, seed abides in us <coughs> and uh we're not going to live in that sin because we are born of god by this uh, verse 10 the children of god and the children of the devil are obvious anyone who does not practice righteousness is not uh does not love his brother and uh i think that you know uh, one of the greatest things besides besides loving god is we we love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We love our brother as ourself. And for this is the message you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. And you know, here's the, the message of John. I thought, hey, he's the the apostle of love. He's the one, uh, you know, that uh, that great one that preached love. And you know, here it is. And he's saying that we should love one another, not as Cain who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for that reason. Uh, uh, for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. You know, it could be whatever name it is, John Smith, uh, uh, Les, or Mike, or whatever it might be. Uh, if our deeds are evil, it, you know, the fruits of the evilness, the fruits of the wickedness, the fruit of sin uh, will appear. And uh, uh, if you live in the righteousness, you walk in the righteousness, if you're living and abiding, in the presence of the love of Jesus Christ, it's gonna be harder to deliberately try and live, live in sin, to deliberately try and uh, commit that act, Lord. And uh, uh, the Lord knows the heart, and the Lord knows how to uh, rescue us from temptation. Paul wrote that, uh, that the Lord knows how to rescue those from temptation. And I, I always had this picture that at times uh, we're like this rubber band, the world and the temptation and the flesh and the devil is stretching us one way and the Lord is just holding on to us and you know, he won't let go. He won't let that rubber band snap. He won't let that kite string snap, but he's always got his hand on us, pulling us back and pulling us back to the word of God. Where do I have to be? Oh, I should be in church. Where do I have to be? I should be in the word. Where do I have to be? Oh, I've been silent. I should be having a word of prayer. You know, I should be with the guys. And uh, the things of the world, the flesh and the devil and sin, of course, are naturally going to keep us away from the things of the word of God and the things of the fellowship of believers, the things of uh, uh, receiving communion, the things of receiving prayer and uh, praying for others. And uh, again, uh, uh, we have a great... Um, uh, guide. It's called the Bible. It becomes our owner's manual for life. And, you know, as, uh, as, uh, as easy and simple as it speaks to our hearts, sometimes as we go over it, we may have gone over it many, many times, 
but God is revealing to us a little bit more and a little bit more and much, much more as uh, time goes on, as we become as those who uh, have walked with the Lord and who have stayed with the Lord. Um, uh, those born of the Word of God. Let's pray. Father God, we do want to thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for the reminder you give us, Lord, about uh, your abiding Word of God, Father God. And we do want to thank you, Lord, that uh, uh, you dwell within us. The living Word of God abides within us. And we cannot willfully live on in sin because we've been born again through the living hope of Jesus Christ, Lord. And we thank you that you lead us and you guide us. Uh, you keep us from those paths of destruction, Lord. And we pray, Father God, that as some were being led astray by the heretical teachers, some were growing weary in the routine and the rote, Lord. We want to stay fresh in, in our relationship with you. We want to be as those uh, keenly in tune, Lord, to the leading and the moving and, and your voice for our lives, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that uh, you've given us ears to hear, hear and eyes to see, Lord, and, uh, and a mind to receive all that you have for us, Lord. We pray you continue to move and minister richly on our behalf the great things of Christ Jesus, Father. We thank you. We praise you ahead of time, and we thank you for what you're doing now. We thank you for what you've done in the past, and we look forward to what you're going to do for us in the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Can we stand and finish in song? <laughs>